Right now, I happen to be joined by our friend Kevin Noon of Buckeye Grove and also, uh, you know, working for Yahoo Sports, Rivals, everything. Did I get everything in there, Kevin, that uh, you uh, you do covering Ohio State football? I think so. I wish I drew that many checks, but yeah, <laughs> I, I, a, little bit, a little bit of everything. <laughs> That's right. I should say, by the way, Kevin, uh, last night on uh, – a Buckeye Rewind, Jeff Rapp, who's part of our coverage, was on here. Kevin is the other diehard Dodger fan who's still trying to get over the World Series that uh, is with us. Because Jeff and I were talking about, you know, Bellinger winning the Rookie of the Year. And uh, that was small consolation for Jeff for what happened against the Astros. And I imagine you probably feel the same way there, Kevin. We'll always have 1988. Yeah, that's exactly right. All right, uh, well, the Buckeyes this week uh, against Illinois, and look, uh, you know, they can overlook them and still win this game, uh, quite honestly. But it was interesting. I'm interested in your take on what we heard from Urban Meyer yesterday, who was pretty uh, terse in that he didn't want to talk at all about the college football playoff, didn't want to go anywhere other than – we're worried about today, the next practice, game to game. I'm going to be on keeping my eye on practice Tuesday to make sure there's no slip up. He seemed to be setting a tone, was he not? Yeah, absolutely. I think that it's just a no nonsense tone. I, but we could go through and do all the autopsies of the Iowa game that we want to, whether or not they took their eye off the road or not at that point. And, you know, I don't know if we're ever really going to have a great answer for it. And, you're right. Ohio State just really needs to roll out of bed against Illinois in theory to be able to be a team that's more than a five touchdown underdog. Oh, oh, and eight in their last, you know, in their last eight games has not won a Big Ten game this season. But you know, you want to have your team playing its best football at this point. And you know, some ways I think you can campaign for the college football playoff by not campaigning. Look, we're so focused on our on on the task at hand right now. We're not concerned about all this. It'll all sort itself out. But you know. That's still going to be out there. People are going to they're going to be keeping an eye on Ohio State. If they have any chance of getting in, um, they obviously have to win their games. But Kevin, they may, they may have to win their games like they did last week against Michigan State to kind of drive the point home that it's an aberration. So even though you're playing a lousy Illinois team, you don't want to be ahead you know twenty one to fourteen at halftime and just have a lackluster kind of game. They need to. They need to hammer them. I mean, they do, and that's the uh, you, you say you hate to have to look at scores and win the beauty contest, but you kind of do at this point if you're Ohio State, don't you? It's absolutely a beauty contest. We've taken computers completely out of picking the college football playoff. It is an eye test, and a 28-10 win, while it's a win, and essentially puts Ohio State into the Big Ten championship game. If, if, if Michigan loses to Wisconsin, it's even a more likely. Uh, position for them to get into it but you need to get out there and win those 48 3 you know 51 nothing type of games because you do want to show as you said it is an aberration it was not it's not what this team's about you know you look at what they do against michigan state what they did against you know a very down nebraska team that's what this team is capable of doing and they can compete with anybody because the, the charter of the college football playoff is to pick the four best teams and when ohio state's on I really have a hard time saying that they're not one of the of the four best teams, but when they're off, oof, yeah, it, it isn't good. Yep, a uh, little schizophrenic uh, with Ohio State football this year. Visiting with Kevin Noon, Buckeye Grove, talking uh, about the Buckeyes. Of course, senior day uh, in the stadium against Illinois. Wanted to ask you also, Kevin, recruiting wise, what is the latest? What is the story on Emory Jones? Long time commit to Ohio State, one of the ballyhooed quarterbacks that Ohio State could could have in their quarterback room but still taking visits elsewhere do you think the staff is thinking that you know this kid's probably not going to end up signing with us where do you stand regarding uh with the Emory Jones situation well I think that if I had to sit there and pick one school that I think he ends up at just based on odds I like Ohio State's odds the best. And I know that Ohio State's been making a lot of contingency plans and they've been bringing quarterbacks in and they've been offering quarterbacks just to make sure you don't get into a position where you don't have one because Urban Meyer was pretty blunt in saying you have to take one every year. If you don't, that's where you get in trouble. So they're going to take a quarterback. And, yes, I know Emory's been flirting with Alabama and he recently was at Auburn, which is really down the street from where he lives in Franklin, Georgia. But, you know, I'm sure Ohio State would love for him to shut it down and 
and sign at the early signing period, December 21st, December 22nd. But when you recruit nationally, you recruit nationally, and you're going to have to deal with this kind of stuff. And we really are in the era of modern recruiting, and it's just kind of how things go at this point. But uh, you know, I think there's, that, there definitely should be some well-founded concern, but, you know, Gun to my head, I'm going to say he ends up at Ohio State. Kevin, uh, the early signing period, which is going to be new this year, uh, and I thought Urban Meyer, he's brought this up before, but yesterday uh, when he was talking about the early signing day, he said one of the things you got to remember, too, is you have those signings and then you don't know how many of your underclassmen are going for the draft. Now, they probably have a decent idea, but they don't really know um, and then you're going to have, you know, the February signing date where you, I mean, how many slots do you have? And if you lose a whole bunch of guys, it is an interesting little twist and dynamic and maybe going to take some getting used to this new early signing period that they have now. Absolutely. And I think doing a signing period in late December is absolutely the wrong time. If you're going to do an early signing period, you need to do it much earlier than this because it does create kind of that bubble of where, you're on, the, you're on the cusp of your bowl game unless you're playing one of the really early bowl games, and generally those are going to be your group of five teams. So you, are, you, know, you don't know who's going to be coming back at that point, and you may be sitting there thinking you're going to sign a class of 22 and you get seven early signings, so you think you have 15, and then suddenly you find out that you have, a, I don't know, Jalen Marshall deciding he's going to leave, yeah. but you have Tyquan Lewis deciding he's coming back. Yep. You don't know, and it shuffles what you have at each position. So I think you're going to see a real frenetic finish. And I think it's going to be even worse for the uncommitted student athletes because they're going to get bombarded at that point. But that just seems to be the MO of all of the changes that they make in terms of recruiting. They never seem to really take the student athletes uh, welfare into consideration, in my opinion. Yeah. We got senior day coming up and you, you know, it can be a junior day too, because there's a lot of those underclassmen that are going to be making the decisions uh, that could be leaving Ohio State early playing their last game on Saturday. I want to ask you, though, we were talking about quarterbacks and quarterbacks of the future and uh, Emory Jones, and, of course, we know what the quarterback room is like behind J.T. Barrett. But J.T. Barrett's final home game, he's um, a, an amazing career. The records that he's putting up, a lot of them, you're hard-pressed to think that they're going to ever be broken, and yet he feels underappreciated at times. How would you describe the career of JT Barrett. The fact that he is so polarizing blows my mind beyond yeah. the nth degree. I cannot believe how polarizing of a figure he is. His pro- I mean, yes, there have been some points where maybe the games have not gone his way. Maybe, maybe the play calling wasn't all that great. But when you sit there and you look at the numbers that he's put up and you look at the leadership and he's a three-time captain and everything along those lines, it's going to be one of those situations where it may not be in a year or five years, but there's going to be a situation where people are going to look back and, and realize how good they had it under J.T. Barrett. And I know that, that, that the, the polarizing parts of, 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 of his legacy, you know, people will come after me on that, but I really think that when you look at the totality of his career, he's going to go down as one of the great all-time Buckeyes. Couldn't agree more, Kevin. Hey, thanks for uh, a few minutes. Appreciate it very much. Anytime. Very much.